Welcome back. I am here with Terry Loveless for the second part of our two-part interview. Terry, you left us on a bit of a cliffhanger last time. We we're talking about this, I guess you'd call it irrational fear of mannequins, but maybe it's not so irrational. I think there's a lot of people for the reasons that we talked about with the Uncanny Valley who may have some experience. However, given your craft experience where you had people queued up no clothes on, just holding their clothing in their hands. Maybe there's something to that, but you had the experience with the panic attack. What happened after that? After the panic attack, life calmed down for me. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible experience. As I said, anybody who's had one knows that it's unpleasant. The fear of the mannequins that isn't all of it. There are a couple of things that I have that are irrational fears that I trace back to my experience in 1977. I'm convinced that's the root cause of, of these irrational fears. For instance, I have a fear about being in open spaces. I would rather walk a mile and a half around an open field rather than cut across it in the middle because I feel vulnerable. And I don't know where that comes from, although I think I had so much anxiety about leaving the tent to run to the car when we had that experience in June of 1977. I think it might be tied to that. And another thing that's very common, because I've talked to lots of people who have the same kind of issues, and that is I have a ritual I have to go through at night before I can go to bed, and that is check every door. I check the closets. How many people check the closets before they go to bed? Yeah, not not many. Make sure the alarm is set. I sleep with a light on. And the bathroom door must be closed. The bedroom door must be closed. Closet door must be closed. Drapes have to be drawn. If all this isn't just right, I got to get up and make it right or I'll never get to sleep. And sleeping in a hotel room is just not possible. At least a decent night's sleep is impossible. And I've never had a bad experience in a hotel room. I think a lot of people that have had these kind of experiences that were frightening have trouble with sleep. Sleep seems to be a common PTSD symptom that manifests for people that have had this kind of issue. Even people who've had traumatic experiences in general. I have a friend who was an Iraqi war veteran. And when he first got back, he would wake up in the middle of the night immediately reaching for his M4 rifle, right? Even though, you know, obviously not there. So PTSD in general, there's sleep issues, and at least for him specifically for the beginning years. Yeah, we had children at home, and I, I couldn't have a handgun anywhere but a safe, you know? So uh, I wouldn't have one out in a drawer anywhere. But to the kids went off to college, I felt more comfortable with a, a pistol in my bedside table, along with a high power flashlight. Never took either one of them out, but I, I, I slept better just knowing they were there. I think that's that whole PTSD thing. You know, the other thing I can't stand is what my daughter calls a jump scare. You know, when you're in a movie, uh, you're, watching, you're watching a movie, maybe a, a cheap horror flick, and there's bad guy pops out and boo and everyone's supposed to be shocked and have a laugh. I can't appreciate that. Yeah, I don't like them either. It's not that they're scary. It's just it doesn't do anything for me. I wouldn't say it, I have fear of it. I just, I'm annoyed by it. It's just annoying. Annoying. Like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not entertainment. I know that. Since the event in 1977, not every year, but lots of years, I'll see one or two things in the sky. And if I'm fortunate, I'll think to grab my phone or my camera and take a picture of it. And I have a collection of some pictures of odd things in the sky. I, th I think I sent you one example. Yeah, I mean, it looks it looks like a pretty clear UFO. Like you know, a disc-shaped sort of snub nose kind of object. Yeah. And I don't think everyone can see them. I was coming out of a doctor's office. My wife was at the doctor, finished her appointment. This was you know, here in Dallas. 
We walked to the parking lot, which was in back of the building, and went through a set of double doors. And I saw this woman standing at her Maxima with car keys in her hand, and her head's tilted back like this, and she's looking at something, and her mouth is open. And I like so I look up, and here's a cigar-shaped UFO, a big one. I mean, fairly high up, but I mean, big enough to see that it couldn't be something else mistaken. It wasn't a blimp. It wasn't a, well, I don't know what it was, but I said to my wife, I said, Sheila, look at that. And she's like, what? And I'm like, right there. You can't miss it. I don't see a thing. And I know she was trying. Mm -hmm. And I yelled to this woman, Madam, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And she just nods. She doesn't say anything. She just nods her head like, yeah. So we stood there and watched it. And then it just went away. It just flew away. So we went to the car and went home. But yeah, I don't think everybody is wired to see them. I can give you a theory, but it's a wild one. So there's a book by a physicist. Uh, his name's Itzhak Bentov. Are you familiar with him? I am. Yeah, yeah, I am familiar with him. So stalking the wild pendulum. So his view is evolutionarily as beings or matter, for all intents and purposes, as it rises in consciousness, it can perceive things that resonate at higher frequencies. So again, this is pure intuition. It's got nothing to do with any science that I can think of, but perhaps that as human beings evolve, people who are able to perceive those things are able to see them. So if you look back in kind of distant history, I think there's certain colors, like I, I, I want to say it's, uh, you're familiar with the wine dark sea, right? The term, the wine dark sea. I, I'm not, but I got to tell you, I'm colorblind. Oh, are you red, green, colorblind? I am. Yeah, actually, so am I. But I think several thousand years ago, I don't think there was a word for the color blue. Yeah, I think, no, I've heard that. I've heard that because it's so, it appears so rarely in nature. It's in South American butterflies and one or two more things, but it's very unusual. You know, I mean, we see the ocean, depending on where you're at, as, as blue sometimes, but... Yeah. I'm, well, in the ancient world, they called it the wine dark sea. And wine, wine is not dark. blue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Also, blue is higher on the frequency spectrum than red is, right? You're familiar with Doppler shift and things like that. Yep. Red has a longer wavelength. Longer, yeah. 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 So, again, just a theory. But if you imagine maybe there wasn't a word for blue because we are evolving to perceive higher frequency data. And maybe these things vibrate at a much higher frequency than everyday reality vibrates at. Because again, prior to the call, we were talking about we're all, matter is really, it's both a particle and a wave. And we could all be manifesting these physical bodies in a higher order consciousness that is keeping all our molecules together. Right, because we're mostly nothing, right? 99.9999%. Yeah. Yeah. So, in fact, there's a principle called quantum tunneling, right? I'm familiar uh, with it. So, it is highly yeah. unlikely, uh, but physically possible to literally, you know, you can teleport yourself across the room. Now, the, the probability of that happening spontaneously is like once in five times the life of the universe, right? It's highly yeah. unlikely. But but yeah, you know, the fact that one quark in your body does that, it's, it's happening routinely. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't mean to take us off into this quantum. No, but I stuff. All right. So Terry, going back to the examination room on the craft where there are these insectoid like beings or praying mantis type beings. You're on the table, it's warm, you can't move your, your mouth, your eyes are kind of darting around. 
I don't know if you mentioned how many of them were in the room, but how many of them in the room and what happened next? There were two. There were two, but one was just kind of there. One did whatever procedure they were doing to me. And again, I want to stress that it had this clinical vibe to it. I didn't think of it as a torture session, but whatever they were doing to my lower back hurt like hell. And I was screaming through clenched teeth, but I was screaming just as a pain response because it hurt. And I think my screaming annoyed this thing. (laughs) I, I really do. And it bent its head down toward my direction. And I heard it with crystal clarity in my head. And it said, why are you screaming? Stop screaming. You know, we don't hurt you. You know, we take you back now. Stop screaming. And he tapped me on the center of the forehead with the green digit and I was out. I thought about those words over the years and it implies that we've done this before. You know, we don't hurt you. You know, we take you back. That to me implies you should know better. I should have known better than to scream. I think I genuinely annoyed this thing. And that kind of brings us full circle because after I was out, they must have redressed me. I had no memory of that, redressed us, and they kicked us out. I remember I was barely conscious, and I woke up, and I was in the field 30 yards from the car, 20 yards from the car, maybe some distance from my car, and the tent and the campground were back at that. And I remember thinking, they screwed up. They should have put us back in the tent. And yeah. I swear, the moment I thought that, these four grays came out of nowhere, and they carried us back. I was semi-conscious and just t- tossed us into the tent. And then I was out for some period of time. And that's the next thing. My next conscious thought was, what are these lights shining through the canvas of the tent? And that kind of takes the thing full circle. Going back to the examination room, can you describe these insectoids? You said they touched your head with a green digit. Like how many digits did they have? I recall Were they claws? Them, I recall them because this guy was using a stainless steel tool of some kind and manipulating it. But they had, in addition to, I don't know how many digits, they had kind of claw-like, hand-like things like, like a praying mantis would have. And then there were like barbs or something I don't know if they were dexterous with those or not, but there were multiple appendages on the forearm. I picture them in a white lab coat. I don't think they wore a light white lab coat, but that's how I picture them. They were green in color. Their eyes were multifaceted like a fly or a bee. Head was triangular and they had a mouth that had multiple parts to it that was just kind of ugly. And you would think that'd been the most frightening thing that happened to me, but really it wasn't. It was the most painful thing that happened to me. But maybe I had had interaction with these things before. So I don't know. Did you have the same feeling when you looked into their eyes that you did with the tall white-like being? No, I didn't. I didn't. I think the six foot tall, chalky, pinkish guy wanted to send me a message. I think he wanted to know what I know. And then I think he wanted me to know that I was here and he was here. I I really believe that. I really think that was the purpose. That was the object of the exercise. So kind of intimidation, really. To what end, though? That's That's the weird part. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. You know, I don't. What's the purpose of all of this? I wish I knew. Mm-hmm. OK. All right. So going back to the tent. <laughs> yeah. So they threw us back in the tent and I was unconscious again. And as I said, I woke up to the flashing lights. The craft thing had descended from 3000 feet to 30 feet over the meadow. And that's why the lights were so intense. And 
they were also they were they were flashing at odd intervals, uh, real bright like a camera flash. So I saw those lights coming through the canvas of the tent and woke up and that's when I discovered that my boots were on unlaced, my socks were on askew, I, I had my body aches all over. I sat up. I was like, oh. And that's when my friend is looking out the flap on his side of the tent. And I asked him, what are you looking at? Is it park rangers? And he said, or he didn't say anything. He didn't say anything that I remember being sensical. And I looked out on my side, and that's when I saw the little gray guys walking around the meadow. When you were on the craft and he was next to you, did you sense him? Did you sense what he was doing? I could sense that he was there. I couldn't quite see him. I don't know if that was just intuition or what, but I felt like he was right next to me. And when they came and got him, that validated that he sure was. Okay, so you're full circle. We're back in the tent. Have there been any other experiences that you've had since June 1977 with these entities? Ten years later, 1987, my wife and I are living in Lansing, Michigan. I'm doing work in the law. It's an autumn. It's a nice September, October day, and I'm going to take my motorcycle out for a ride. We had kind of a Sunday ritual. I'd go out for an early morning bike ride, be back home by between 10 and 11, but I was always prompt. I, I was usually home right at, at 11 o'clock. And I went out for my bike ride on a route that I rode many times before. And I chose that particular route because it was farmland on either side. There were no cops, no traffic. There were some turns and some hills, and it was just a nice ride. And this is when I had an episode of missing time. I wondered, how do people know if they've had missing time? I mean, how do you know? Because it's such a seamless event. It was for me. I was throttling back from 80-something because I knew there was a turn, pardon me, a turn, a curve and a road coming up. So I throttled back to 60-something, blinked, and then I'm on a gravel road doing 30 miles an hour with nothing but corn stalks on either side of me. You know, late season brown corn stalks. And I'm like, how did I get here? Because <laughs> I knew I'd never take my bike on gravel because it's dangerous and because it's bad for the motorcycle, chip the paint and the like. Well, did you even know where you were? I had no idea where I was. I stopped the bike, put the kickstand down, and... There's more to this that I don't want to go into right now, but I reasoned that while I'm here, I'm pointed this way. If I turn around and go back where I came from, I should be able to find my way back to Blacktop. And I did. I put my helmet back on, got on the bike, rode back, and I was about three miles maybe, and I was back to Blacktop Road, and I knew where I was. Now, all of that... If I just made a wrong turn, all of that should have eaten up maybe 10 minutes of my time, maybe less. I, I inclined to think less. I get home and my wife is just absolutely a basket case because I, I'm an hour late. And this is days before cell phones. Mm -hmm. And she's like, my guy, where have you been? You know, and I'm like, what, what, do you, what do you mean? Where have I been? Um, I mean, I was on my bike ride. Now I'm home. What's the big deal? And I had on a leather jacket, and these leather gloves, so I couldn't see my watch. I just assumed it was around 11 o'clock. And then I walk into the house and I'm trying to calm her down. And then I could hear Nickelodeon on right. <laughs> the kids watching Nickelodeon. And I knew what time it was. I knew it was a few minutes after 12. And that was hard for me to process. I have gone over that a hundred times and there's no logical explanation for that. So there's at least 50 minutes there that I can't account for. Do you have any memory of what happened Not in that 50 minutes? Not a bit. 
All right. Well, that's a topic, I guess, for a future regression, hypnotic regression session. It is. When you're ready. When I'm ready. Yeah. And any other incidents? Well, the, there was discovery of the implants in my legs, which I think I mentioned earlier was kind of uh, tough to process because it validated that these things had put their hands on me back in 1977. Then after that, the latest event. Well, by the way, where, where were the implants? They were in your legs or? In my right leg. One was lateral to my knee and about six inches above the kneecap. That's the square structure with two wires attached that went up. And then below my knee, there was a collection of what the radiologist said was the consistency of bone tissue. And that's why they, they refused to remove it. Interestingly, the VA, of course, is a entity of the federal government. And I know they took over 20 x-rays of my leg and I got three. And I said, where are the rest of my x-rays? And I had to fight, you know, I had to threaten it. I had to threaten to sue them to get copies of my x-rays. They kept giving me a runaround and just delay, stall, delay, hoping I'd go away. The one in your right leg, who do you think put it there? I don't know. I mean, because it's it, it set. It sounds more like something that we would do with the wires and something that's like a, a square structure, a microchip, right? Some the other one s- sounds a little bit more advanced. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've, I've heard that exact sentence before from someone from To the Stars who said the thing above my, le- above my leg, in his words, was looked like an RFD device. Yeah, RFID chip, yeah. That's that's it. Um, I'm not yeah. an electronics guy. I, I don't know. I know this. I, I got it on an x-ray. I got a buddy of mine I went to law school with who works for the eighth well, he's re- just retired. He worked By the way, the- Terry, that's why these guys don't talk to me. <laughs> ah, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I, I had a buddy who worked for the ATF. I can say he's, he's retired now but he was still employed with them in 2015. And I sent him a copy of my x-ray and I said, can you help me identify this electronic device? Because the ATF has the biggest database of electronic devices in the world, going back to flight 103 over Lockerbie. Mm -hmm. That's how they track that was pieces of electronics, resistors, transistors, little pieces of uh, radio, so they thought that there was a need for that because electronics were kind of part of bomb making back then. He confirmed for me that whatever the device is, it's not in their database. Yeah, I mean, you can do a custom designed ASIC without having to register it. Like I could probably build something like that. I mean, it's been decades since I've done anything like that, but... Yeah, you well, can yeah, build something I, like that. It wouldn't make sense to use one from Radio Shack, right? I mean, that... Yeah, yeah but it would have to be an organization with resources, right? And the organization with resources would have to have access to... With an ASIC, you would need access to like a... I mean, Intel is probably way too big, but there's probably some arm within a company like Intel that works on classified programs, right? There has to be. So, or it could be Lockheed, it could be some large corporation, or they could do it in-house, they could do it at a national lab. So for an internship, I worked at Booz Allen Hamilton, and one of the projects that I worked on, it was working on uh, things with DARPA. And one of the things that DARPA was working on, this is back in 2003, so, or yeah, 2003, 2004, that time frame, they were working on these things called MEMS, MEMS devices. So micro electromechanical systems. So in your iPhone, there are MEMS devices. So like pressure sensors, actuators, GPS chips, things like that. 
But back then, they were not only looking at MEMS devices, they were looking at NEMS devices, so nano electromechanical systems. Okay. So this is 20 years ago, but this is after, this is well after your event. But I think at that time, our electronics were sophisticated enough that you would be able to create a tiny chip like that. Because really, it's, it's not that complicated. You would just kind of have to transmit some sort of beacon. Right. And, and the purpose a, of that would be to track to track my movement, right? Yeah, your location. It's not I could probably like again, I I haven't done anything in electrical engineering in like 30 years, but if you gave me a week, I could figure out how to build something like that. It's not hard. Yeah. So I, it sounds to me like it's if I had to guess, be you know, some Air Force OSI sort of tracking, but again, I, I'm I'm just throwing out something in the dark. The other one sounds more organic. It is organic. Yeah, but that that's what the doctors tell me. This is organic. It's bone tissue. We won't take it out of your body for that reason. So that would require, like you said, somebody who's a little more sophisticated. Um, when did that one show up? Same time. Same time I went in. Yeah, yeah. October we we definitely 20, didn't have that technology back then. Yeah, I went in October 2012 to the doctor's office because I had pain in my knee, couldn't walk. They they confirmed that it was a Baker cyst that was causing me pain. It was a cyst underneath my patella. Baker cyst is they, they are always benign. Catch it like you catch a cold. You got a sore knee for a couple of weeks and they go away. That's nothing to worry about. And my pain was never related in any way. To the things in my leg i don't i think so that the thing in the knee by happenstance drew attention to what was in my leg that i had no idea was there and so the organic one which leg was that in oh uh, they're both in the same leg they're both in my right leg the square structure is above the knee and then the collection of bones in like a floret pattern that those are oh, yeah. the calf muscle of my right knee. I went to my first UFO conference before I published my book. I went there in 2017. It was a conference called Paradigm Shift or something down in Houston. Mm -hmm. And I met Daryl Sims. I met Travis Walt Walton and I talked for hours and got to meet some people that were involved in ufology. And I'd never done that before. I was going to immerse myself into this field and learn about it because I knew nothing about it because I've been avoidant about it. And there were some guys there that they're from San Antonio and they had a uh, syndicated television program called Ghost Lab. And I can't remember, there, it was like three brothers. I can't remember their names, but Ghost Lab was the name of their show and they had big truck trailer with ghost lab painted on the side of it. And they'd go to these haunted locations and do all the stuff that people who hunt ghosts do. So we got to talking and the guy's like, Hey, would you feel like making a drive down to San Antonio? And he said, if you pay for the gas, we'll pay for your hotel room and let's get together, have dinner. And then we'd like to film your story. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. Sure. So I did, and I had a, oh, what's the clip on microphone? Lavelle, Lavelle, what's the name of that? Lavalier. Lavalier, thank you. Yeah, look, I have my own, over, I'm not using right now, but yeah, that's exactly, it. yeah. I, I had on a lavalier, and they're recording me, and they got like a little studio set up, you know, the board with the slides and everything. And a10 Mini, I think it's what it's called, All right. Or switchboard, I guess. It, it depends on which technology, but it's like a switchboard, right? Yeah. Dials and buttons and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And they got a sound guy and a video guy. So the sound guy is sitting at this table and he's doing whatever they do. And we're wrapping things up. And I'm going to take my lavalier off of my collar. And as I did, I fumbled it dropped it and it landed on my knee, my right knee. And the sound guy goes, shh, 
you know, and kind of hushed everybody in the room. And he's pressing his cans next to his ears like this and listening. And I just kind of moved it up toward that square structure. And he said, I hear music. Uh, evidently, whatever was in my leg, I was in San Antonio. It was a Mexican radio station, and it probably an AM station, and it was just playing music. And he could hear that over the microphone. Everybody took turns listening to it. You know, I had to listen to it. So I don't know. Evidently, this thing can track me, but it has the ability to receive too. I don't know if it has the ability to transmit stuff. I don't know. So the microphone, the lavalier mic hits your knee. You're listening to a Mexican radio station. Well, I couldn't hear it. You had to be wearing the headphones at, at the desk or whatever this guy was sitting at. But if I held it near the object above my knee, they could hear it. If I held it at below my knee in the calf muscle of my leg, where that florette pattern of bone is, they could hear maybe just a fraction of it. So whatever it was coming from, the square structure above my knee. Yeah, which means the square structure was transmitting a frequency. Like it was, it was sending out a signal. And for some reason... Maybe the lavalier mic may have picked up this, the may have picked up the signal and either shifted the frequency some way, or uh, the, I mean that I mean again I'm just it's been about thirty years since I focused on this stuff. But that sounds like it's like you're just picking it up. Yeah. So that just tells me that that device was definitely transmitting a signal somewhere. And, and that would make sense. I mean, if the thing is designed to track me and follow me, that you would want it to do that. And did you ever have it removed? No, I never did. I'll tell you why. I've had two heart attacks, two heart surgeries, and the VA, I went to the VA first. I, I saw these x-rays. I got an appointment with a VA uh, surgeon. And I carried my laptop with the, with the uh, x-rays on them. And of course, he had them in front of him anyway. They weren't on film. They were just digital. And I said, you know, I got these things in my leg. I want them taken out. And I told him, I said, I'd like a forensic protocol on the thing above my knee so that we can preserve the integrity of it. We know that it came from my leg at thus and such a time, who was the surgeon and then who received it and just a typical chain of evidence. And he's like, yeah, 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 I got that. I, I take bullets out of people. I know how to do that. So he says, all I need is your cardiac clearance letter. And I went to see my cardiologist and my cardiologist has said, no, I can't do that. And I said, what do you mean you can't do that? They just want to take this thing out of my leg. And they said, yeah, we know, but it's probably going to require anesthesia and it's going to involve opening your skin. It's going to create a risk of infection and it's a risk versus benefit analysis. You could have an arrhythmia on the table and the risk outweighs the benefit. Taking the thing out and she said, I don't care how exotic you think it is or how strange you think it is. Taking it out, the standard of care in this country is that they do the risk versus benefit analysis. And if it doesn't work out to be a benefit, they let it sit. And I got angry. And she's like, look, man, you know, she says, look, calm down. I got vets from Afghanistan, Korea, Vietnam. He, she said, I got a, vets walking around with all kinds of metal on them. And they want it out too. It irritates them. They want it out of their bodies. But she said, especially for the older guys that may have had some heart issues. That's a no-brainer. We just don't do it. But she said, even a young, healthy guy, if he's got something deep, you know, a fragment in his leg deep and it's healed and it's not bothering them, that's kind of a real close call whether to do it or not. So I couldn't get it done, not in this country, but the standard of care in Mexico is different. 
So I got a hold of a surgeon in Tijuana and asked him, I said, and I explained to him and I sent him copies of the x-rays. And he said, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to do this for you. And I said, I need a chain of custody. He said, hey, no problem. I do, we do it all the time. And that was in October of 2017. And we were talking about the first week in December, my wife and I going down, visit some friends in San Diego and then hop down to uh, Tijuana. And November 17th, 2017, I woke up in pain. And if you look in the back of Incident at Devil's Den, the first book, there are photographs of the holes I had in my leg. And I don't know why the holes were at the top of my leg. There was a kind of a pattern of bruising that came out, but that wasn't until about 30 hours later. But I woke up that morning and I had this really deep wound in the top of both legs. Now, why both legs? I don't know. Maybe there was something in my left leg I didn't know about. I'd had my left leg x-rayed and they didn't find anything. So I could take my fingers and pull that wound open, both of them, about a quarter of an inch. And I could see down in to, there was no blood. I could see down in almost a bone and a uh, weird injury. And I knew that they came and they took this thing out of my leg. They took I, it out? They took it out. Yeah, they sure did. I told my wife, I said, they came last night and ET came and took his merchandise back. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like, uh, uh, and this is the square, the square one. Square thing. Yeah. The thing that's yeah, most valuable, of course. That doesn't sound like ET. I don't know. I mean, given the wound and. Yeah, I went, you know, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get an x-ray. And, you know, you can't just walk into a freestanding radiology clinic and say, hey, you know, I'd be an x-ray. You need a doctor's. And I'm racking my brains. And I thought, ah, I'll go see a chiropractor. They look at 100 x-rays a week. They'll x-ray my leg for me. So I didn't have an appointment, but I had copies of my x-rays on copy paper. And I took them with me, went to this chiropractor's office and didn't have an appointment. And they said, we'll try to fit you in. And they fit me in. I waited about an hour. They were busy. And the guy calls me back and he says, okay, where do you hurt? And I said, at the top of my legs. Were you in an auto accident? And I said, no. And he said, let me take a look at what you have here. And he saw the wounds and he's like, how did you get these? I said, I don't know. I woke up with them. Terry, that's definitely us. You know how I know it's definitely us? Oh. Because only we would be stupid enough to do both legs, just to be sure. That's very good reasoning. That is very right? good reasoning. Absolutely. Absolutely. That thought never crossed my mind. Yeah. Well, he said, you know, what happened to you? And I said, Doc, I'm going to be absolutely honest with you. I went camping in 1977. I believe I was abducted by aliens. And in uh, 2012, I had an x-ray in my leg and I discovered these two foreign objects in my leg. And I think they came and took one out last night and I need an x-ray to verify it. And he's like, all right, then. Yes. Well, thank you for coming in. And he's got me by the elbow and he thinks I'm crazy. And he's walking me yeah. toward the front door. And I got these two x-rays on copy paper and I'm holding him up in front of the space. And he stops about a foot before the door and looks at them, takes them and says, come with me. And we went into his office and he shut the door and his phone's ringing and people are knocking on the door. Like I say, the guy's busy. And I, I sat down at the desk. And he put the two pieces of paper in front of me, kind of shoved them in my direction and said, tell me about these. Give me a 90 second rundown. What are these? And I told him. And he said, I don't have extra equipment here. He said, I use a freestanding radiology clinic. It's a mile down the road. And he said, I'll write a, a prescription for you to get an x-ray with an understanding that you won't mention my name or the name of my clinic in your book. And that you let me see the x-rays afterward. And I said, sure, absolutely. I appreciate the help. Thank you. Thank you. I think this guy must have seen this kind of stuff before. 
I mean, why else would he have treated me like this? Or was he just hyper curious? I don't know. So you had an organization reach out to you that had looked over your case. Okay. In the timeline, was that before or after this device had been removed? Here's the timeline. I had the encounter in my house with the entity called Betty. That oh, you got to talk about that. We'll get that back to a, that. But that, that was yeah. the third week in October 2017. And at that meeting, she told me, ET will not allow you to take these things. And she didn't refer to them as ET. You know, she, she referred to them as her hosts. She said, my hosts, and the word hosts is kind of interesting. I mean, you can, it could be a noun, it could be a verb, you can host a dinner party, you can be a host. But that's how she referred to them. And she said, my host will not allow you to take this object and have it analyzed by terrestrial scientists. She said, they won't allow that. And she said, if you try, they'll come and they'll take it from you. So I was half expecting this. I just wasn't expecting it to be November 17th, 2017. And then I published my book on March, March 10th of 2018. Somebody was, doesn't want us to finish this. Yeah, it seems that way, doesn't it? It really does. Okay, so Betty, which you referred to the entity says her host, host, H O S T S. So whatever put the organic structure in your knee was she referred to as a host? Well, no, I, I think they put both structures in my knee. I was considering having the one above my knee removed, and. She knew about that because she said, you can't have it removed. He, you know, her host won't allow it. They'll come and take it from you before they'll let you do that because it can't fall into the hands of terrestrial scientists. So sure enough, November 17th, they came and they took it out of my leg. And I, I still have the x-rays. You know, you can compare one against the other. I mean, you don't need a medical degree to hold it up to the light and see that the thing is missing. Now, I, I took the x-rays and dropped them off at the chiropractor's office. And he was busy. I didn't wait to see him. And uh, I got him back. But he called me that evening after dinner and said, did you look at your x-rays? And I said, yes. And he said, did you see that the, that structure is that's on this piece of typing paper is gone. And I said, yes. And he says, well, did you see that they left you something? And I didn't know what he meant. And on my x-ray, and I have the x-ray film, the original x-ray film, on the film, and I got a picture of it in the back of my book, but it's pixelated. And it's, it's not a real good picture. You know, you can see it really clearly if you hold the x-ray up to a light source. There's a piece of wire about uh, maybe three quarters of an inch long that is the consistency on x-ray film as metal. I wasn't wearing pants or anything when I took the x-ray. I took my pants off, so it wasn't anything in my clothing. And he said, there's a piece of what looks like wire running parallel with your femur, just about at the midsection. And he says that that should not be in your body. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, well, I have two theories. He said, you had these wires attached to the square structure. It could be a piece of that wire, but he said, this looks a little bit bigger in diameter than the wires showed up on the x-ray that you took. And he said, I don't, you know, if they're smart enough to take it out, would they be stupid enough to leave a fragment in your body? He said, I don't know. But he said, my thought is that they gave you an upgrade. You know, maybe took out a 1977 model and gave you a 2017 model in return. So going back to this entity, Betty, tell me a little bit more about that encounter. Because I'm just trying to wrap my head around all this. 
this is difficult. This is the woman, I call her a woman, that I referred to as Sue when I was four and six years old, who used to, whenever they would take me and I'd be with these other kids in this playroom, this big dome playroom. By the way, when did those memories come back to you? After the book, in the nightmares after the book, and the big dome room and the geometric figures, those didn't come back to me until 2019. I was at UFO Congress and we were having dinner and I sat next to Deb Cobble. If you know Deb Cobble, she was one of, oh, what's the guy's name? He did hypnotic regression and he was mm. really is if I can think of the name, I'll say it and he'll go, oh yeah, of course, of course. I can't think of the guy's name. Anyway, she went to New York City and was regressed by him. And we're sitting together at this Mexican restaurant having a nice meal and we're kind of like swapping stories. And she grew up in uh, Michigan in kind of rural Michigan. And she said, you know, when I was a kid, they used to take me to this domed room full of kids and we'd all play together. And as soon as she said that, it was, and I don't think it was implanted memory. I don't think it was made up on the moment. It, it, I, I remember this. I'd be in my pajamas and my night clothes. The other kids would be in their night clothes and we would all play together. And there was a woman there, and I called her Sue because she reminded me of the Japanese lady that lived in back of us. And we would play, and she had us playing with these geometric figures. And Deb Cobble said, yeah, I remember that. And you remember how you moved them? And I said, yeah, we were supposed to stare at them and try to move them with our minds. And I said, yeah, I remember, I, I remember this. I, this is crystal clarity now. I, I, I remember this. So she had been in the same room. You know, she might have been in the mix of kids. I don't know. How did I get on this thing? In the beginning of Incident at Devil's Den, I talk about I would see these four little monkeys that I thought were benign, comical, and they would come into my room. And you in the beginning, they would ask, they would hold out a paw and say, why don't you come with us, Terry? We're going to go play. We'll have a lot of fun. And I did that a lot of times. Sometimes I'd get scared. One of the nightmares that I had that started in my 20s, I would have the dream and the monkeys would be in my room and we'd be going through the same scenario, same dream all the time. And it held out like it wanted, wanted me to take its hand, only in the dream, it holds out these ugly, long, gray fingers. And that dream just, I flip out. I, I still have it on occasion. So Deb Cobble would be a great person to have on your show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the experience that I had. That's why when I saw her in 2017 in my living room, there was that familiarity there. I think I said that I felt affection for her in a maternal way. Was this at night or? 2.30 in the morning. And were you downstairs already or did you kind of become conscious when I she was, was there? Asleep in, I was asleep in bed. I woke up in my chair in my living room and had no idea how I got there. And I don't sleepwalk. And it was I, this a physical experience or no, this was this wasn't this was physical experience. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And this being what did she look like? Four foot tall, maybe a little more. She was dressed in human street clothing. Black blouse, black slacks, a red scarf around her neck because her neck was pencil thin. She had a wig on, like a black cheap costume wig. 
and it was too small for her head and it was sitting kind of sideways. And before she took her glasses off and I recognized her, she reminded me of old cartoon series, The Flintstones, Fred and Wilma's next door neighbor, Barney and Betty. Betty. She reminded me of that. Uh, okay. Because if you look at the cartoon, Betty Rubble has this black hair that's kind of spiked out. And that's yeah. what her wig was like. That's what she looked like. And I, I thought, you know, that's who this is. This is Betty Rubble. You know? Of course, when she took the glasses off, because I thought to myself, I wish she'd take those glasses off. And we communicated telepathically. As soon as she took the glasses off and I could see her face, I recognized her. And I knew that it was Sue from when I was a kid. She didn't look like she had aged a day. And I said, why are you in my living room? She advised me not to write the book and said that my, the government would not be pleased with you. And she says, you can't take, have the thing taken out of your leg and examined by terrestrial scientists. My host won't allow it. And I asked her, and this was kind of poetic, I thought. I asked her, I said, you know, who are your hosts? When you say host, who are you referring to? And she says, you call them aliens. I call them my host. They're not alien to me. That was the answer. I think she's a hybrid. I think she's some kind of, uh, and maybe half human. I mean, there's a lot of human characteristics to her other than the fact that she can speak telepathically. In my book, An Incident at Devil's Den, and we may have talked about this already, the, the three reasons of why all this is happening, you know, we're working arm in arm with ET, or number one, toward a shared goal. Number two, we had some kind of treaty agreement, contract, whatever, with ET, and, and a quid pro quo situation. They give us technology, we give them something. Let's just say, for example, taking people from national and state parks. And they've exceeded their bounds and they're violating that agreement. Uh, th that's what that, that chip sounds like to me, like an audit. Audit? I never thought of it. I never, th I never thought of that, but yeah. Again, I just, I mean, it's a supposition. But yeah. It feels like, <laughs> I'm afraid to ask this question again, because this is what kind of got us cut off. You had met with that organization that had investigated your case. Mm -hmm. Where was that in the timeline with this? Was that before or after your thing was removed? This was before. This was how, how, oh, same year? No, November 2017. And then five months later, I published the book in March of 2018. So this is five months before I published the book. Okay. And then where was it before? Where, when did you meet with the organization? Or when did you have your thing investigated? Oh, about six weeks after about six weeks after my book hit Amazon. Okay, so that was well after. That was well, well after. after. Well after, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well then there's no Yeah, I don't think there's a nexus there between the two. Well, I shouldn't say that, but I don't know. I don't know. Again, complete hypothesis. The government is not monolithic as, as much as the stereotype is. But I think there's a bunch of different factions that have different motivations and different goals, let's just say. I, I think there's one organization that probably knows more than any others. I think there's some trying to figure it out. I think there's some that want to disclose as much as possible. And I think there are others that just want to keep it quiet forever. So it feels like it was an audit. Like if we have some sort of agreement with some entity or group of entities, maybe they've been exceeding their bounds or have been lying and some other organizations trying to audit them. It's sure a possibility. 
you know, I, I just uh, am thankful that they kicked us out of that thing. You know, those other human beings that were in there, you know, they went, who knows where they went or what their ultimate fate was. But yeah, I, I was just glad to have been kicked out. Okay, so there's this metallic device, this metallic wire there now. Yes. Do you have pictures of that? I have pictures of it in my book, and I have the original x rays. Um, they're in my. Yeah, you could just send it. You could, if, you, if you have pictures, you could just send them to me, and I can post them as we're talking. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, you look at it in the back of the book where I could send you a picture, but there's not much to see. Wow. Um, you know, you really need to see the x ray film where you can illuminate it from behind and, and see it with clarity. Because it, it just doesn't show up. Taking a photograph of it, it just doesn't come out. And maybe I don't have photographic equipment that's sensitive, you know, sophisticated enough to get a good picture of it. That host's comment, though, is really because my, my first thought of that was the U.S. government. Right. Like hosting us on this, this world and part of the agreement is, again, this is all supposition. Terrestrial scientists cannot see this because at the end of the day, if E.T. wanted or whoever, we keep saying E.T., but we don't really know if whoever these entities are did not want to be known, there wouldn't be any interaction whatsoever. I mean, if they wanted to be known, there's nothing we could do to stop them, right? They would oh, just... No, absolutely not. But that said, I think it's our side of the table that doesn't want this to get out. And I think whoever is visiting people and taking people is abiding by some sort of code or agreement. Yeah, I do too. I spoke with. I somebody. mean, based on your the, the data points that are in your story, or what, what do the lawyers call it? The the fact pattern is that what they call it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Based on the fact pattern, that's what it feels like. And my story is not all that unusual. I mean, there are a bunch of people, you know, just like Deb Cobble. She's a great example of somebody that's had interaction with non-human entities over the course of a lifetime. And she's a really, really nice lady. Still trying to think of the name of the psychologist that did her regression, and I can't think of it. So going back to your story, so this Betty individual, right, appears to you in October, then on November 17th, you had these holes, you found these holes. Right. What happens then after that? And then, sorry, and then you get the x-rays back, you have the wire. What happens after that? I took pictures of my wounds. They're, they're in my book. I've got the originals in a laptop that broke down on me. I need to take it to somebody that can go into it, get the images off of it for me. What happened after that was I photographed it and had to add a chapter about Betty to my book. Because my plan was to put it on Amazon for Christmas 2017. Mm -hmm. And there was just too much to redo to get that finished. By the way, the experience with this dome structure. And, you know, there's a book that I'm sure you're familiar with that Whitley Strieber wrote called The Secret School. That it's kind of about something similar, at least in Texas. I know of the book, but I haven't read it. Yeah, it's 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 hard to find. I mean, you can get it, but you're not going to be able to get it new, or you can, or you can get it on a Kindle. I think probably a little bit easier. Except it's, it, I think it's more in his prepubescent years that I think he has memories of that sort of thing. But anyway, any other strange interactions that you recall? You know, I, I think we covered the thing on my phone. 
where I had the event where my phone showed that the health app on my on my uh, yeah no I don't think we I don't think we I don't think we recorded it though okay well let's cover that because I think that's hugely important April sixteenth of twenty nineteen I'm in bed sleeping my wife's next to me since nineteen seventy seven sleep has been an issue for me I'm uncomfortable with the night so I sleep with the light on. A dim light, but I sleep with a light on. The door to the bedroom has to be shut. The door to the bathroom, closet door, everything has to be shut. Window shut, blinds closed, drapes closed. And I have this ritual that I go through that I was told was kind of like typical PTSD folks where I have to go through, I look in the closets, I check the alarm, I check the doors, I check the garage. Um, Have you ever talked to Preston Dennett, by the way? I've met him and I've talked to him, but not at length. So this is based on his research. It is pretty common in abduction experiences that the entities come out of the closets. Bedroom is the most common place to encounter these things. I, I heard that. Like I said, I left my email address in the back of Incident at Devil's Den. And I said, look, if you've had an experience and you want to share it with somebody, tell me about it. And I had, well, as of now, I've had 4,200 some people send me emails about their experience. I got one this morning. It was lengthy. And I wasn't expecting that. But it's kind of uh, a privilege that these people share with me stuff they've never shared with any other human being before, because it's pretty common that we don't talk about it. It's just not discussed. But I look for commonalities in all these stories, and I found a bunch of commonalities. Yeah, the closet, the bedroom window, lots of people going through the ceiling, through plaster and walls. Mm-hmm. Heard that story. I've had people tell me that they have their own bedtime rituals that they go through. Got to sleep with a gun by the bed. I don't have a gun anymore, but I do a high power flashlight. There are a whole list of commonalities. You know, it, it's interesting. I met Travis Walton and I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm thinking about publishing this book about my abduction experience. And he was kind of like, you know. <laughs> And I'm like, no, 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 really. And I started talking about it. And we ended up talking for three hours. Mm -hmm. Same thing when I met Calvin Parker. When you meet somebody, if you've had this experience and you meet someone else who's had that experience, it's like there's common ground there. How many of these things do you get where you just read it and then you're like, this person's a complete wackadoodle? A lot. Uh, 10%, I'd say. How do you? siphon or, or, or filter out those or how are you able to filter out those call i guess call it false positives well you know and again i i don't want to sound judgmental here because i don't i'm not judging yeah yeah and I, I don't either i'm just trying to ask the question because i don't i don't want people to think that we're you know i try it yeah how do i filter it out i tried to read the email i read it twice and i try to take it in its totality because take into consideration is this person a native English speaker? For instance, I got a email from a woman from El Paso, Texas, who is not a native English speaker. And in broken English, she told me that her son is seeing a orb of light come through the window and it manifests in his room as a raccoon and talks to him, but the mouth never moves. And the way it was phrased, it sounded absolutely ludicrous. But it was just it was, it was just language, right? It was just language. Just language. Something about it rang true to me. My son yeah. speaks fluent Spanish, so I had him help me with interpretation. And I included it in my second book under the Spanish word for raccoon, which I can't remember off the top of my head. But great, 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 great story, though. But... Yeah, I try to take it in its totality and think, is this is this legit or is this not? 
And there's also a mental health component. There are also some people, and they may or may not have had an experience, but mental health issue is a component in them recalling the memory and, and giving a, a cogent account of what they experienced. So I had some that I, I think have that element as a component. And uh, so I try to filter out all of those. Like I say, about 10%, I read, I try to respond to absolutely everybody. And there was a core group back in 2020 when I wrote this book. There's more now, of course, but back then there was a core of about 400 people out of 2,200 that had really cases that sounded really solid. Mm -hmm. And I distilled that down from 400 to 50, and then from 50 to 25. And I took the 25, what I thought were, were best, the best of the best. And I called them cases and told their stories in my book. So, you know, abduction, missing time, everything. Okay, so going back to your bedroom ritual, because we're getting to the iPhone. Yes. Incident. Right. Yeah. April 16, 2019, I woke up in the morning. I sleep with my phone by my bed and earbuds, and I listen to meditative apps at night. This routine goes back to the early 80s when I put my Walkman headphones on, you know, and listen to a Maxell cassette tape with Deepak Chopra or something meditative, something or some kind of soothing music, orchestral music, maybe. That's interesting. So why the meditative music? I, and again, we didn't talk about it on the call, but we talked about the 432 hertz frequency. Somebody emailed me and said, are you familiar with the Monroe Institute? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And they said, well, you, you should be. And then, of course, I found out a lot about them. And that's where I found out about the binary beats thing. Yeah, Hemisync. Hemisync. I got some CDs with Hemisync music. You put headphones on and it's different frequencies in each year. Yeah, and it's the difference in frequencies is what you're is what it's piping through your head. So you're probably trying to get to a I can't remember exactly what the right if you're trying to get to I don't know which wave state, if it's theta wave state or alpha wave state, but it's I want to say alpha. I, I, I should know that. Yeah, I want to say alpha. I think that's but right. alpha is more of a you're still for the most part fully conscious like we are, but David Morehouse says it's ideal for remote viewing. But I think there are lower frequency brainwave states that will a theta wave I think is lower that'll get you closer to like the Monroe Institute was for astral projection things like that that that's a lower theta wave state yeah so but whatever it is it's the difference it'll be something less than you know eight to twelve hertz and what started me doing this was, you know, if I hear noises in the middle of the night that wake me up, I, I just, I freak out. I mean, I have to get up and investigate what I heard. And I just prefer non-interrupted sleep. And the only way I can get that is to put on headphones or put in my earbuds now and listen to that. So on that night, I had my iPhone in my breast pocket of my t-shirt. I got a t-shirt with a pocket on it that I sleep in. And I got a uh, case because I have heart disease. I was told that I should have a protective case to put this thing in. So I got a case that supposedly blocks anything that would be harmful to my heart. I listen to meditative music and it just uh, is how I sleep. And I've done it for so many years, so many decades now. That's the only way I can sleep. I mean, I, I, I have to be like that. So on this night, I don't remember what I was listening to, but I woke up and I was completely out of breath. And I was just starved for oxygen. I thought I was having some kind of cardiac event. And I told my wife, I said, I think, but I never had any chest pain. And I told her, I said, something's wrong. You, better, you should call EMS. And she did. Ambulance came and got me. And my... my Pulse was tachycardic. It was like 175 beats a minute. 
through the roof. But that calmed down. That calmed down fairly quickly. By the time the medics got there, the, the EMTs got there, my pulse was still elevated, you know, maybe 125 in that range, but it, it wasn't in the range of tachycardia. And my oxygen saturation was like 89. So I was definitely starved for oxygen. And they took me in the ambulance and gave me oxygen. And that really helped. That really helped. By the time we got to the hospital, I was feeling pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I've had enough heart disease to know what they do. They do chest X-ray, cardiac enzymes, and an EKG. So they did that. And I was there about six hours. And the cardiologist said, you know, I, th I think you may have had an errant beat of some kind. I don't know what accounts for this, but, you know, I have no reason to even keep you for observation. We're just going to cut you loose. And I said, great, fine with me. I'm sick of sitting around the hospital, right? So I go home and uh, I feel fine. I had dinner with my wife. After dinner, it's my routine to go out and go for a walk. You know, mile, mile and a half. And I left the house about 7 o'clock p.m. And I pulled up my health app, expecting to see that I walked 200 and some steps because I spent the day in the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what my steps were, but it shows there is an XY graph that shows stairs climbed. And there was one spike, one red spike at 523 a.m. when I was supposedly sound asleep that went six foot straight up. And I looked at that and I, I, I didn't know. I, I was just confused. I thought, got to be something wrong with the app, got to be something wrong with the phone. You know, I took it to the, the carrier. I took it to Apple and no, nope, phone was fine. App was fine. As far as they were concerned, the phone was 60 feet above the house at 5.23 a.m. So, but the phone was in my pocket. So I think I was along for the ride. That's my conclusion. But I kept that phone and kept everything untouched and gave it to Lou Elizondo. So he's got, he's looking, he's interested in, in the story. So we'll see what he has to say. I wonder if, because there's a pressure sensor on that iPhone, right? Because it has to be able to detect barometric pressure and things like that. That's what the lady at the I, Apple store told me. I, I, did, I had no idea. I thought height, I'm not a scientist. I'm not science minded. And I just assumed that height would have been measured by a change in GPS, but it's not. It's like, just like, yeah. it's what you just said. It's changing barometric yeah. pressure. And she told me that, and I'm thinking, you know, the barometer on my wall in my living room. And I'm thinking, this is, how accurate can that be? And she says, oh, it's very accurate. She said, within inches. So literally, you were, the phone was 60 feet above your house. Yes. Unless somebody extremely sophisticated were somehow able to tamper with your phone when you were in your bedroom asleep, right? Or yeah. hack into it. Again, like it sounds completely preposterous when I try to find more legitimate alternatives, right? Doesn't it? I had it does. I had one guy right. email me and said, This is pretty simple. You strapped your, your iPhone to a uh, drone and sent it 60 feet up over your house. Why? I, I don't know. You know, I can barely operate the phone, much less, much less you know, fly a drone. What? But I've seen the chart. It's like one bar. Right. So with a drone, <laughs> how are you going to get it through the roof? Are you going to cut a hole in your roof? Right. So there's that explanation blown out of the water. Next. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. As far as I'm concerned, absolutely. And I mean, there are no stairs in my house. And yeah. The only way you'd be able to do that is if you went outside, stuck the strap, the phone onto the drone, flew it up, and then flew it over to the point where you were in the house, and then flew it and flew it back up. Right? 
there it wouldn't show a straight line it, it would show like uh what is that i don't know if that's not an l but it's like a, a stair step here. thing i know what you i know what you're saying yeah. because the passage of time is moving and and it would yeah yeah i i get you i i, I yeah it wouldn't be straight up it would you it would have to have a step and then back directly over your bed because yeah. this is just directly over your bed right directly i mean it that's 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 the room where I was. That's where I was. I mean, you can't. Yeah, the GPS. The GPS would measure your. But your position. you know what? That's a good. That's a good point. The GPS would tell my location. At least it would show that I was at my home address. Nothing else. Within. Maybe a hundred. Well, I don't know how accurate the the GPS is. I know that we could we could be within in the military within a hundred meters or so. So as long as your front steps aren't 100 meters, or at least more than 100 meters from there, it probably couldn't be faked. So anyway, I'm not J. Allen Hynek, so I don't have to come yeah. up with uh, <laughs> yeah. like these, these, these crazy explanations to describe swamp something. Gas, that, famous swamp gas thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the light explodes over here, and then it explodes over here, and it looks like it, it's straight lines. <laughs> no. I went to Hillsdale College. I guess it's Hillsdale, Michigan, where, where the event happened, where the college is. It was an all-girls college back when it happened. And I'd been in court that day, so I was wearing a suit. I was in my car, and I'm driving through. It's a really pretty little campus. And I saw an old guy, like 60s out doing uh, like yard work. He has got a, a rake and a, on bags of leaves. It was autumn. So I pull over and I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, fine. And I said, hey, I just wanted to ask you by any chance, were you here when that event happened? And he kind of rolls his eyes and says, yeah, everybody wants to know about the UFO thing. And he says, yeah, I was here. And I said, well, what happened? He said, well, I can tell you what. There is no swamp gas because there is no swamp. He said, it's a manicured lawn. I know because I take care of it. Out of the dorm windows where the girls and the faculty saw this thing, it were a couple of trees and freshly mowed grass, and there was no swamp. Never was a swamp. So, and I'd never heard that before. Now, I don't know if you guys lying to me, but he sure seemed uh, genuine to me. Yeah. Uh, he I mean, also, I'm not surprised. He also said, and I didn't know this, but I did verify this, that there were two county cops two nights before the event at the college were on a road somewhere near the college, and their squad car was chased by a glowing orb, orb of light. And they made a report of that. So, yeah, I guess uh, J. Allen Hynek, I guess, got tired of telling lies for the government. Yep. In his later years, he kind of, there's a redemption arc there for sure. Yeah. I met his son at UFO convention in San Francisco in February 2012. Mm -hmm. Real interesting guy. And he was uh, working with uh, a television producer on, and I, I don't get cable TV, I don't watch TV, so, but a show called Roswell or, or something, something to do. Uh, he was working as kind of an advisor on that. And we ended up sitting down, we talked for like an hour. Um, I was selling books at my booth and he just sat down, we started a conversation. And he told me all about his dad which was really interesting, you know, sounds like great guy, you know, like all of us that were supporting a family worked a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was interesting. Interesting. And anything, anything else, any other Sioux stories? That pretty much covers it. I, I wish I had more, but in a way I'm glad I don't. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, I a, think... it's a weird emotion. On one hand, I'm like, you know, they haven't been around in a while. What's the reason for that? 
And Robert Hastings told me that, you know, a lot of people, once they hit that 70 mark, communication stops. Hmm. Have you ever heard that? No, that's the, that, but again, I haven't, I haven't delved into it deeply at all. Yeah. But 70 is kind of the. Yeah. He said you reach an age where it just, whatever purpose you served, you no longer serve that purpose. So there's no longer a need to, um, to reach out to you. And what do you think that purpose is? Boy, isn't that, that's. I know that's not an easy question. That yeah, don't we all wish we knew? That's the big one. That's the big question is the why. So. All right, my friend. I could talk to you for hours. So, but I know you have lots to get done today. So I appreciate the time that you so graciously shared with me. And I mean, an amazing, an amazing story, if not a scary one for you. So Thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.